You know, I was kind of thinking this. Uh, Paul wrote a lot of letters to a lot of churches. And each church had their, had their problems, uh, you know, had their rebukes from Paul. And, uh, you know, and uh, Paul blessed them and he encouraged them and uh, he praised them for what they were doing right. And, uh, you know, in, in praying, you know, it was like, okay, you know, Lord, what are you saying about this church? And, you know, and, uh, you know, and I think it's, it's to a lot of churches. Uh, I think this, this is a, a thing we all need to get back to uh, in, in the church all around this region uh, and even this nation. But, uh, but uh, Lord, what, what do we need to improve about ourselves, what do we need to individually take responsibility for uh, in the kingdom of God, and uh, wh where's our part, and what is our purpose in that? So I really, uh, I really shared Pastor's heart on this back to Pentecost. I really, I really just, it just, just resonated, and. Uh, and, and thinking about that and just, just praying, and man, I went through several different things I could have said. Uh, really, really what I feel, this is, this is just a start of what I'm, uh, what, what I'm going to tell you, teach you guys about. It's just a start of what the church needs to do. And uh, so, I, I mean, we're going to go through lots of scripture, but uh, this, is, this is just the first step. Uh, into understanding why th this needs to be done. So uh, my heart is uh, that we become one mind and one accord. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does it, can anyone, what does one mind and one accord mean? Have the mind of Christ. Okay. Uh, how about, how about in the, the context of, you know, where that, where that comes from? Where, where does that phrase come from in the Bible? Anyone know? Anyone besides Pastor? <laughs> Acts two. Acts two, yes. <laughs> Acts two, where it says, uh, you know, they were all in the upper room in one mind and one accord, and uh, and the Spirit came. So, uh, you know, what the thing is is uh, that that was a unity. That that was uh, that that was a strong unity that they came into to one mind and, and and one accord with one another in the same purpose and that God's God moved in that because they were all in the same mind and uh, actually in the Greek the word that uh, one mind uh, one accord comes from is uh, uh, homa thuma don <laughs> I can't even say it right. Uh, and of course that means with one accord, but the significance of that is is that the word is all throughout the book of Acts. It's not just in Acts 2. It's all throughout the book of Acts that the church was in one mind and one accord. It wasn't just in prayer either. That was just, that was just the first step. That they, they were uniting in prayer, so that I, I love that we're, we're, we're starting to get into prayer and we're really starting to to unite in prayer, because that's what they did in the, it, it says in Acts 1, 14, that they came in one accord in prayer with uh, actually the mother of Jesus and, and, and Jesus' uh, brothers, and, and there was 120 believers that were in the upper room, and they were united in prayer. They were in one accord in prayer. So uh, there is a real significance that this this word is used uh it's not like i counted it but i mean a dozen times throughout the 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 first century uh well not even the first century church but just the early church in acts that this word being in one mind in one accord and uh the 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 meaning of the word is one mind one accord and with one passion with one passion so this, this is all throughout the book of Acts, uh, the early church, and they were accomplishing the will of God being in one mind. I know I'm, I'm beating this dead, 
but I'm trying to get this. Like Pastor was saying, we're, we're beating this until you get everything out of it. In one mind and one accord, the, God moved. Amen. And the church was victorious, and the believers were blessed, you know. So uh, we're going to start in Philippians chapter 2. No, we're not starting in Acts. <laughs> We're starting in Philippians chapter 2. So what's the first step in becoming in one mind and one accord? Because, you know, we, we instantly assume coming into this building that we're in one mind and one accord. Uh, I forget what verse it's saying. It said it, but they were in one mind. I think we're going to go over it. Uh, actually, we are. We're going to go over it. But uh, it says that they were in one mind and that they were in one place. Well, what would have happened if they were just in one place and not in one mind? We would get where we're, where we're at today. They were, we were able to get them into the building, but we weren't united truly together in one mind and one accord. So... As funny as it is, I, I broke down verse 1 and 2, cause, <laughs> but the rest of it, and this is quite obvious, we're going to be talking about unity. Unity in the body. And, and man, all that requires to see that unity. I mean, we're going to read the rest of the chapter, but I really felt, felt like uh, verse 1 and 2, just bringing that out. So... In verse 1, I, I got this in the King James Version in my papers here. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, and then the next verse, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Uh, so we hear one accord and of one mind. But we're going to go back to verse 1 here. If there, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if there are any comfort of love, if there are any fellowship of the Spirit, if there are any bowels uh, and mercies. Uh, I like what another translation, the New Living translation, there, if there, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship in the Spirit, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me, my joy complete in being like-minded, having the same love, being in one Spirit and one purpose. I like being in one Spirit. Uh, that sounds, man, that sounds like a good phrase right there, being in one Spirit. But, so... You know, you can take this and you could say, you know, in 1 Corinthians 3, 4, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy and it does not boast and it is not proud. You know, uh, you know it, it's just kind of like this. If uh, Paul, what, is it Paul? I, I, I couldn't even honestly tell you. Yeah, it is Paul. Um, it's kind of like this. He's asking if you have it, I mean... If you felt the love of Christ and, you know, that fellowship with the Spirit, I mean, being in unity surely shouldn't be so difficult. You know, it, it's going to be hard, but that, that should be the desire of your heart. There should be a fire in you that says, you know what, I, it's going to be hard. You might be a totally different personality, but, man, I'm going to try to be... I'm going to try to unite with you. I'm going to try to, to build a relationship with you. And, and that's actually how it starts. We're building relationships with one another. I can't, I can't, I can't build, you know, get in one mind with you or one accord if we're not talking, <laughs> for one. Yeah, communication. There you go. Yeah, we have to have communication. There, there has to be a desire for you to know me and for... And, and, and likewise, for me to know you, if I don't know your heart, then how am I supposed to share in that same heart? In uh, Colossians 3.12, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, 
Who's that? That's us. We've been chosen. We didn't choose him. We've been chosen. Holy and dearly beloved, loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And that's in an NIV. Uh, what, what really uh, reminded me, uh, I kind of got this just last night as I was going to sleep. I was like, well, if we are of the Spirit, then we're going to show, we're going to bear fruit of the Spirit. What's that? That's love, peace, joy. There you go. It, you know, it's also said that, you know, it says fruit, and it doesn't say fruits. It's, it's said that love is that fruit, and that everything after that is the explanation of what that is. And, you know, you read uh, First. Corinthians chapter 13, there's a whole explanation of love. Well, then you go back to the fruits and you're just like, well, I guess they're just explaining love because that, that's what it is. So self-control, gentleness, kindness, goodness. Uh, if we have these things, if we are of the Spirit, then it is just part of us. It, it just, uh, it's a fire shut up in us that we can't help but be gentle and kind and and, act, and, and want to know each other and build relationship with each other and to get into that one mind. I mean, it's not like we're forcing anything. It's not like we have to say, okay, I've got to build a relationship with you. I've got to get in that one mind with you. No. God's empowering us to do that. God's empowering us to do that. So, so we need to, I mean, it's, it's kind of like this. As we get in, in the spirit, I mean, if that's not a fruit of us, then I, I don't know where you're at. Because <laughs> it's, not, it's not in the God's will. It's not in God's kingdom. God's kingdom is to unite uh, in, in one mind and one accord to accomplish his will in, uh, in the earth. So, and we're going to go to Romans 15 real quick. We're going to be doing a lot of page flipping. Romans 15. We're going to be reading uh, 1 through 7, verses 1 through 7 in Romans 15. We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive, sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others to do what is right and build them up in the Lord. So right there, we're talking about a fellowship a fellowship of believers that is not just meeting together and worshiping, but that we're building each other up. And uh, I like how Jude says it, that we're building each other up in the most holy faith. Uh, so when fellowship, like I said, is more than a building. It's more than us coming into a building. It's more than us singing, this, singing worship together. Uh, it's about coming into that, that same mind. And you know what? I'll skip on and to say that in verse 2 of Philippians 2, 2 there. Not only are we like-minded, we're sharing the same heart. But this is what really been burning in me, that we're, we have the same love. I find it so hard to grasp how... You can go church to church to church, and the love is different. Is this, is God's kingdom so, you know, is every church God's individual kingdom, or is it all the same thing? It should be. It should be. So, if I, if I were to go across the street to whatever church is over here, uh, you know, they should share the same love I have. And if they don't, well, there's a problem. And it, and it goes straight back to unity. It goes straight back to being uh, in the spirit and showing those fruits. But, so having the same love, you know, 
and, and believers should be able to come, or unbelievers should be able to come here and then go to another church, and they should have this, feel that same love. There shouldn't be a difference, a same, a same uh, long suffering, a same uh, gentleness, kindness. They should be able to feel, you know, feel that same thing, uh, even a love that's willing to. You know, say that, you know, this needs to be fixed in your life. I mean, there should be that same love. So, I mean, that's just been burning in me, but uh, I like what the New Living Translation says in that verse. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. That was, I'm sorry, I'm flipping around. Uh, Phil, Philippians 2.2. 2. Okay, let's go back to Romans, though. <laughs> See, I got the verses on paper, and then I got the Bible here, so it's, it's easy for me. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know it. Yeah. <laughs> For even, uh, we're in verse 3, for even Christ did not live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O oh God, have fallen me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, and the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God, who gives us patience and encouragement, help us you live in complete harmony with one another. Complete harmony? Wait, wait, wait. So we're going to be in harmony. There's not going to be division in the church. There's not going to be, uh, well, rude, rude remarks just thrown up in the air. This, that, that just doesn't happen. There's supposed to be a harmony. A harmony with each other as it is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. You think about it. We're supposed to be uh, living examples of Christ. I don't, you know, Jesus is going to try to live in harmony with us. Uh, he might not agree, and he'll tell us <laughs> he doesn't agree. But he, his heart is, you know, that love is long suffering, and he's going to tell you what's up. So, so uh, this is what's going on. You need to fix this. I still love you, but you need to fix this. There's a grace, and that's what grace is. An empowerment to change. In verse 6, Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I love this next verse. I love this next verse. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. Let's say that again. Therefore, accept each other as Christ has accepted you. So by the same grace, by the same love and hope, by the same mercy Christ has shown you, we're supposed to show each other. That's deep. That's deep. Let, let's let that sink in. That's deep. That's what we need to get to. We're not, we're not all perfect, but that's what we need to be striving for. Yeah, it's a totally different level. That's forgiveness, for one thing. Being, you know, not having unforgiveness in your heart and things like that. So, therefore, accept each other as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. So God's given glory in that. There's a, God's given praise. Uh, uh, there's a worship in that that we are accepting others as he's accepted us, it's actually a fruit. If we're truly accepted by Christ, then we'll accept others as Christ has accepted us. That's a fruit. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. And he came that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his miracles unto them. Well, we're, we're actually stopping there. Yeah, I read on too far. But anyway, so acceptance that, you know, Christ accepted us and that we are to accept others. Okay. Just trying to collect myself here. 
skipping around. Okay, so, and I'll just quote this. You don't have to turn there. You can if you want. Acts 1, 14, and I said this already. These all continued with one, one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary and the mother, the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And, uh, but, but, but listen to this, though. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and we know this, we know this, we know this verse. We preach it all the time. We know this verse. We know it too well. But I'm going to bring this out to you now. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place with one, they were all with one accord in one place. So, you could take it this way. The day of Pentecost came when they were in one accord in one place. Where we see when the Spirit came, which we call Pentecost, and what, that was the festival in that day, Pentecost came when they were in one accord in one place. So, you know, you're talking about calling the church back to Pentecost. That will happen when we are in one accord in one place. So when we are in that one accord, that, that's when... Uh, we'll be back to Pentecost, back into the kingdom will of God. That's when we'll be, uh, we'll be obedient to, to the Lord again. And I'm not saying we're not right now. We're, we're, we're asking God for grace and mercy right now that, you know, we're just like, you know, we, we got some issues <laughs> that need to be resolved before people come in here. And, and you know, they're going to see flaws and things like that. But we got some deeper issues that is just going to absolutely just throw them back on their heels and say, you know, I, no, I, I don't want to be part of that. Right now, there's, there's, there, there isn't, and, and there's some of that, and I'm, I'm not saying there isn't, but that, that love, that long-suffering, that patience, that gentleness, that kindness, you know, we're not exactly there yet, and we're not there in, in one accord, too that all of us are like that, that this is, let's just take it there, uh, that we're a family, and that we're truly a family, not that we just say, oh, you know, you're my brother, you're, you're my sister, you know, it's not a title, it's what you are, that's what it's supposed to be, but we've made it a title, <laughs> it's kind of like this, we say, Sister Denny, and, and brother Denny, you know, as if it's their first name, you know, <laughs> instead of being, you know, you know, that's my brother, that's my sister, you know, this is my older sister, you know, <laughs> this is my older brother, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, that, you know, that, that they're truly our family, you know, and you know what, we'll get there, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, We're, I'm getting ahead of myself, we're going to go to Ephesians 4. Brotherly. We are brethren. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like this. We've been grafted into the family of God. And you, you go in Israel, everyone's a brother and sister. You know? That's just how they treat each other. You know? And they call it, you know, even in the Bible, it's, it's like, you know, rebuke your brother. It's not your neighbor necessarily. <laughs> East St. Louis. Yes, yes, yes. All right. You got me distracted now. I got to find Ephesians. Ephesians is a little tricky for me. All right. So Ephesians 4, you know, and I actually had this in a dream, Ephesians 4, a few, about a month or two ago for somebody. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I told my mom, uh, but uh, it was actually the, uh, a girl I'm praying about, right? And I told you guys about this, and, you know, uh, she was being, uh, in the dream, she was, you know, being torn at. You know, people, she had her face in her lap, and people were just clawing at her, and, and just a whole crowd of people, and, and, and they were just beating up on her and whatnot. And uh, this random Bible just came out of nowhere. <laughs> I'm like, what's this? 
I'm like on bleachers, and there's this random table with the Bible. So I pick it up, and it's Ephesians 4. And I told her, you know, I really felt like the, what, 17th or the 14th, the 14th verse. Then we will no longer be immature children, being, you know, being tossed back and forth to every wind of doctrine. And uh, we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with clever uh, speech. So anyway, so it's just talking about maturity. But, and we'll, and we'll get there too. <laughs> uh, so Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 here. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. So be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make an allowance. Allowance? I'm going to make an allowance for your fault. You know, whenever you offend me or, you, or I feel like you hurt me, you know, I'm just like, you know what? Love of Christ, you know. Christ loved me so much, he took my faults, you know. I made an allowance for that. I'm just like, okay, all right. I still love you, you know. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. With peace? Peace can be in a church. Peace? You sure? You sure? You sure we can have peace? You sure, you sure we can be united in spirit? In spirit. That all of us together can get in one mind and one accord through the spirit. We can do that. Okay. I don't know. I don't know yet. We'll see. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord. Now, oh, man. We talk about denominations. And we talk about how the kingdom is so divided right now. In this nation, that's not true in, say, Africa. Shoot, they're like, we need help. <laughs> we need to bind together to save our nation. They have a humble heart. But this is, this is a revelation for uh, those who are no Baptist or no Pentecost or no uh, Methodist. No, I'm Catholic. I can't do that. Or no Methodist. No, no, no. No, no, no. It says, there is one Lord... There is one faith, there is one baptism, and there's one God and Father who is over all and all and living through all. So there's one Lord. There's not, there's not a Catholic Lord. There isn't a Methodist Lord, Pentecostal Lord, Baptist Lord. There's no, 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 it's, all, it's everybody. It, we have one Lord. There is one Lord, and there's one faith. There's one baptism. There's only one salvation you know and then there's only one God and Father so we can't be so divided you know he is over all and in all and living through all there's one Lord there's not hundreds of Lords there's one Lord you what he's not divided He's not divided. You know, Jesus said a, a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. And in this area, it's not standing very well. In fact, it's not really standing. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he let the crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Does someone have that in King James Version? I think I like that one better. <laughs> Say it. Go ahead. For verse 7. For uh, verse 8. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led the captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now the previous verse is, 
Oh, okay. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Yeah, that's good too. That's good. I forget what I had for that. My notes don't have my own notes. It's just scripture, basically. I forget what, what that was about. Anyway, so notice that it says, he ascended. Okay, well, they're going to explain it anyway. <laughs> All right, sweet. I forgot about this part. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world in that the same who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now, these are the gifts of Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we come to such a unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So the fivefold ministry, listen to this, the fivefold ministry, what I'm doing right now, I'm part of that fivefold right now. I'm teaching you. I'm a teacher. So the fivefold ministry is to get us into maturity. You notice the apostle doesn't necessarily need the fivefold ministry for himself. There's edification he needs, but <laughs> Paul didn't, you know, the apostles helped Paul and edified Paul, and Paul edified Peter, and Peter edified uh, Philip, and, and things like that nature. nature. So, uh, but the fivefold, the uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, the pastors, and teacher, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the, the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith, in knowledge, in God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. The full and complete standard? The full, complete standard. I don't know what your version says, but mine says full and complete standard. To the measure of the fullness of Christ. I mean, come on now. The fullness of Christ, the complete stature the standard of Christ. So, part of the reason we have division, and we're, we're seeing this, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, with the apostle, the teacher, the well, you talk about a true evangelist. They come in here and preach righteousness. And... <laughs> If you have any tender heart, I mean, you're the first one to the altar. Okay? I remember going to a thing down in Georgia, and, man, I, you know, I thought I was saved, right? And then they started preaching righteousness. The first three services, I was down at the altar. Okay? Okay? So you talk about an evangelist. He preaches righteousness. She preaches righteousness. So it brings us in. We see our unrighteousness, and then there's that, there's that hunger to be righteous before the Lord. There's that hunger to please the Lord. That, that's the whole point of seeking righteousness and holiness. That should be the whole point is that you want, you just, oh, it just, it's just a desire that you just want to please the Lord. You know, it's not like you're, well, I guess your salvation somewhat, yeah, it, you know, hinges on that. Because if you don't have that hunger, then obviously you're just not saved. So, that hunger and righteousness there, uh, for one, it says in Matthew 5, if you hunger righteousness, you'll be, f you'll be filled. So, I really believe the Beatitudes right there is just an instruction manual for uh, salvation. Blessed are those who, who uh, are broken in spirit. There's a brokenness b before the Lord. They're saying, God, I, I can't do it. I need you. And then there's next one, mourning. You're... You're just lamenting over your past life. Lord, forgive me. Uh, and, and it's repentance. You look in the Old Testament, repentance was crying, weeping, mourning, fasting. Sackcloth, ashes, you know. 
And we're just, we, you know, we can talk about the altar of God in this church. I mean, kneeling on your knees isn't much of a sacrifice to the Lord unless your heart's broken before him. And man, back then, you know, it's coming back. We're coming back to that. Because <laughs> American Christianity, their, uh, their, their level of sacrifice is, is nil, you know. That I, all I have to do is kneel at an altar and oh, I'm good. No, there's... If you if you're really saved, it, it's just it just eats you up that 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 last life that you were living that old life. Okay, so I've already lost where I'm at. We're in Ephesians. Oh, you know why I lost where I'm at? This this fan over here is blowing my paper around, my Bible pages here. It's all right. I, no no no, don't turn that off. I'm getting cool by that. Oh. <laughs> uh, Okay, so, so the fivefold is to edify us, to bring us into that maturity, into that, that one mind and one accord. I'm just going to keep on saying, one mind, one accord. And the fivefold, the apostle, pastor, evangelist, teacher, I already forgot it. Prophets, there you go. It's to bring us into that maturity. And if we really desire that, if we really desire the Lord, we're going to submit to what they say, and we're, we're going to test what they say, but we're going to submit to to what they're saying if it, if it's from the Lord, and we're going to be like, okay, I know this is what I need to change. I'm going to do it. And yeah, go. They search the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And, and that was my heart uh, tonight. That's why I was like, nah, don't need that thing. Don't need that thing. Because if you're not searching the scriptures about what I'm saying, uh, obviously you're just not getting what I'm saying, period. So uh, to put it up, up there, just like, okay, well, it, it's up there. I don't have to search the scriptures. Don't bother bringing the Bible. It's just going to be on the screen anyway. Yeah. And I know I'm reading out of a different translation, but... Old folks, that's for the young kids who didn't bring their Bibles. <laughs> well, they got glasses. Okay, all right. Oh gosh. Make an allowance for you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. No, but uh, so, so. Uh, so we need the fivefold to bring us into maturity. If we don't, it says in 14 that uh, if, if we do, then we will no longer be immature children. We, uh, we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. That's huge in this nation. There's a new teaching. Oh, got to do this, got to do this. Oh, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to go over here. and We're, we're going to do this. And, oh, oh, no. Oh, there's something new over here. We're going to do this. And... Uh, man, we're being tossed back and forth because we think we know better than, than God does who God's put in our life to teach us. What? They're oh, they're not staying with the Word? No. For, for a nation that has more Bibles than any other nation, that prints them uh, as New York Times bestseller since for like a century now, we are awfully biblically uh, illiterate. Yeah, oh, statistically, there's only, uh, in my generation, there's only 4% that believes the Bible is absolute truth. Only 4%. And of your generation, or rather probably my mother's generation, uh, like 30%. So, wow, we went from 30, oh, that's, that's something else. I, I, I do have something about that one. I do, I do have a sermon about that one. God's given me revelation on that one. Uh, but, uh... So, so we will no longer be immature like children if we submit to the teachings. Like, and it, it says that the early church, they, they, submit their, they submit themselves to the teaching of the apostles. And that's how be, they became mature. And uh, we won't be tossed and blown about by every new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. We're really good with that. <laughs> Sound like truth. 
Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body of the church. He makes up the whole body to fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing, full of love. Full of love. And the whole, man, I like that part. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Perfectly. Each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy. The whole body. And growing full of love. Okay. We're going to go to Acts. Now, you'll want to turn to Acts this time. Acts chapter 4. Now, man, my heart. This is my heart. I read Acts. I read Acts. I see how the church did it, and it's not being done today. Uh, let's see. I want to see something real quick. I don't know why I don't have this in my notes. You know what? Go two chapters before. We're going to go to Acts 2, but in the 42nd uh, verse. I don't know why I don't have this in my notes. Maybe I had it in the first part. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, I remember talking to a pastor, you know, and talking about the Church of Acts and how it, and how it happened. And uh, he, he corrected me when I said that the Church of Acts is a model. Because right now, and I think we had this conversation, that the problem is with the church today is that it's all about a model. You know, man, when we come in here, it's a model that we, I mean, it's, it's centuries of history why we have pews and why there's a, a podium and a stage. It, it didn't used to be that way. Uh, in fact, you know, the body of Christ actually met in homes. Uh, the early church, yeah. The early church actually met in homes. Uh, you, you, you search, you read history, and you find out the early church was meeting in homes of, uh, and it never got over 15 people in each home. They were splitting. They weren't saying that we need to expand the house. They were saying, okay, well, we need to split. And really, there was a lot of discipling going on because there was more one-on-one -on -one communication. Than there, I mean, how can a pastor pastor a thousand people? Not even Moses could do that. And, and Moses' uh, father-in-law suggested that he set a man over ten people and a man over, what, a hundred people, a thousand people, and, and ten thousand people. And in all major matters, bring him. And all other matters, take it to them. I, I, Moses was being overwhelmed with trying to manage two million people. So, I mean, how can, how can a pastor get to know each individual person? We're talking about one mind and one accord. How can a pastor become one mind and one accord within every individual person? Can't do it. And you better believe if, if, if he tries, yeah, he definitely has to get paid to do it because his whole time is consumed with that. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. Does know what's going on yeah. In their lives, you know? That's good. So I think that's good. You know. Yes. Yeah. And becomes becomes more shallow. Uh, the yeah. If yeah. it gets over, uh, I believe it is 200, you don't have the closeness. 
Yeah. What if I, and I, I think I've already told you too, what if I told you in South Korea there's a church of 800,000 believers? 800,000. You know how they do it? One, one day a month they come together and they fellowship as a, a whole body. Well, actually, you know what? Technically, they, they have services where only 20,000 at a time can come. And, and if you can imagine, they have a hunger for God where, uh, for one, the last group has to run out for the other 20,000 to run in. And if there's any dead time in that, they're just worshiping God. They're just praying. They're just interceding. That's the hunger in South Korea for God. And uh, so they meet once a month and do that. But the other three weeks, and they might even do it on the same week they, they meet together, they meet in home fellowships of like 10 to 20 people. Uh, you know what? And I told a pastor that of a church, and uh, he's like, how is that possible? You know, that, no way, no way that's, that's possible. Uh, I, if, I, if I wanted to do that tomorrow, I couldn't. I don't have leaders in the church. I don't, have, I don't have people, I don't have uh, strong families, strong men to lead those, those Bible studies or just, just fellowships, period. They don't have the leaders. Well, hello, <laughs> but you're not building up the leaders. <laughs> you, know, you know, do it. You know, you need to be discipling. Get a man too. What? Get a man. Well, it... Well, that's how, that's how, well, that's how it should be, though. The, the problem with the church is that we become feministic because the women are, are, have a more intimate relationship with God than the men do. So it's, it's easy, easy for them to you know, take over things because they know more of the Spirit than most men do. I'm not, I'm not saying anything against it, but God's design is that uh, a father is the head of the home. Because there's a dysfunction when a, a woman is the head of the home. Because, I mean, if you have any sons, that's, that, that's going to skew their idea of what a wife's role is. Because uh, they don't have that father, father leading. So, plus, you know, uh, men, fathers were designed to impart identity and direction. Women, they, they weren't designed to do that. So whenever they, whenever they start doing that, they actually, uh, it, it's easier for them to operate in a, a spirit of control. Because that's, that's not what they're designed to, to do. That's not what God created them to do. But they're having to take the, they're having to take that. You know, I like, I like what my spiritual father says. Uh, the, the father is for imparting identity, and that's why we have a very purposeless, my, my generation is very purposeless, is because they don't have fathers give, giving them right identity. They think going to college and making a six-figure job is, is their identity, and we find that, that uh, their job becomes their identity, actually. So, uh, so there, there's a dysfunction in that. So... But the heart is, is that, you know, uh, a fellowship, home fellowship, like those in South Korea where they're, I mean, think how many thousands of those they have. But the, the heart is that, fa you know, fathers, it's, it's not even necessary, it's not just about men and women, it's that fathers are leading it. That there's, because, you know, we, we talk about God, well, we're sons and daughters of God, and and, that, and it's because of Jesus we can cry out to, to the Father saying, Abba. I'm pretty, what does Abba mean? I'm pretty sure it means Father, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Father, Father. There you go. And uh, so, but the point of getting into all of that was that 
uh, in Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 42 through uh, the, the, the end of the chapter, uh, the, the, the believers are gathering together. And, and they're not only just getting a building and saying, okay, meet here. They're like, come into my home. I invite you into my home. I, you know, you're a guest in my home, and I, you know, I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but that, you know, they just had that hunger for building relationships. It was a hunger that they wanted. I, I kind of gotten this when I was younger. You know, I was seeking the Lord, and I was, as I was seeking the Lord's heart, I was seeking, I was, the Lord was bringing me to seek the heart of the bodies, the, the, the body of Christ's heart. Because Jesus is in you, too, you know. So that, that hunger for seeking God also led me to seeking, uh, building relationships, be, meeting new believers. And, man, you know, uh, the, it came out of a hunger of teach me. You know? <laughs> I want to know. I want to know the Lord. I want to know him more. Uh, so in verse 42, all the believers devoted, well, there you go, devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and they all and, then, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Shared everything they had. I, I can't say that I've shared everything I had. But, you know, what's important is that, see, this is where if we say it's a model that, okay, that's how the Church of Acts did it, so we're just going to do it. We're just going to do it. You know, when a, a new denomination comes into the area, they have their own way. They have a church service and, and how the, even how the church looks. You notice that? If it has a steeple or not or <laughs> what the steeple looks like, if there's stained windows, you know. Uh, they, they have a model. They come in there with a model. But uh, the problem with coming in with a model is that it becomes, a, it, 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 the model itself becomes a religion. All, all on its own, it becomes a religion. All, all on its own. But this came out of their own heart. You notice, I mean, I guess before the Spirit came, or, you know, before this, because it's in the same chapter, it's not like they were talking, oh, you must go to fellowship. They weren't even saying that. I, you know, I don't see that anywhere. It, fellowship is supposed to come from your own heart. It's supposed to be a desire of your heart. If you're really desiring the Lord, well, you're going to desire fellowship because that's where you're going to be edified and encouraged. I see it this way. When I come here, you know, right now I'm, I'm benefiting you. But when I come here, uh, it's a mutual benefit. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging and, uh, you know, edifying you. And actually, you're supposed to encourage and edify me. <laughs> uh, but uh, so there's a mutual benefit to that. It's, a, it's not that, you know, you're coming and he gets to preach, you know, all, you know the whole, t you know. It, it's about fellowship. It's about coming together and saying, you know, uh, I, I want to get to know you. I want to know who you are. And, you know, and I've told several of you that, I, you know, I was telling Russell, I was like, man, whenever, whenever we can, you know, let, let's eat after church. Let, let's hang out. You know, we can, we can even fry up some burgers, you know. I know how to do that. I work at McDonald's. <laughs> right, so uh, and you know, food's an easy way to do that with. You know, everyone's got to eat, so you can at least go out to eat with them while, while they're eating and talk to them. And yeah, for the sake of fellowship. But you know, I've been in churches where they have a fellowship. They they have a potluck, and you know, oh, we're having fellowship next Sunday after church, and. You know, the food's good, we're all in there, and we're in the line getting food, and, you know, we end up sitting all at different tables, and we're eating our food, and after we're done, we might talk a little bit about politics or something, the old men, <laughs> the old men talk about, 
And the old women, they're talking about old men. And <laughs> There's a song about that. That's where I got that. Except for the old men are talking about the weather. Well, they do that too. But, but, but you know, they'll, they'll do that and they'll talk about, you know, all that and they'll eat. And, and then they're like, okay, well, I'm done eating. Okay, bye, you know. And, and that's where the fellowship ends. See, uh, I actually go, uh, I actually go to a home fellowship on Friday nights, and I tell you what, from seven o'clock, we don't even have an end time. From seven o'clock, and she gets upset that I come home too late. But I mean, we'll we'll start at like seven thirty. We'll show up at seven, and we'll fellowship, <laughs> and we get to seven thirty, and we'll 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 get on couches and recliners and folding chairs in a circle, and just begin to share our heart. This is something I'm doing. I'm not just preaching about something that I haven't done. This is something I am actively doing. I, I'm actively involved in a fellowship who, whose heart and heartbeat is that we get, we get together and, and we come to that one mind and one accord. That when I'm sharing my heart, you can then respond by sharing your heart and that you know, eventually we just edify each other until we, we're sharing the same heart. We're sharing the same mind. We're sharing the, sharing the same spirit. Because we're, we're, we're communicating with God and we're getting that same, we're getting the same call. We're getting the same, uh, the same will, the same plan. And we're like, okay, I want to do that. You know, I, I want to do what God is telling me to do, telling, telling us to do. Uh, and uh, so this is something I, I'm, I'm actively doing. And I, I have a heart for that. And... Uh, you know, my mom, my mom can tell you that, you know, they'll, they'll want to go out to a drive-in movie. And I'm like, no, no, I, I want to go. I want to go to this. Because I feel like this is going to change something. That we're coming together in unity, a real unity that I have yet found in the church, you know. This one included, unfortunately. Although I do have some with a few of you, definitely. But we're, we're experiencing a lot of division. And, and that, well, and that's that's normal for a church that's just been without a pastor for a while, actually. But, uh, but I really, uh, I just have a heart. It, it's it's something inside of me. It's just God's fire inside of me uh, for fellowship and really getting to know people. I mean, I've I've been taking people out to lunch. I mean, it's I just want to know them. I I want I want to edify them. I want to encourage them. I mean, that, that's, that's my heart, and that's what I've, I've been about for uh, some time now. And, uh, but, so, I mean, the, belie- the believers, they had, they had a hunger for fellowship. It's not that it was, it, it was part of a doctrinal statement. It was, you know, I, I want to be encouraged. I want to encourage my fellow believers. I, I feel like I'm part of a family, and I want to be there. I want to I be at, you know, Pastor Denny's house, and, and uh, I want to, I just want to hear him speak into my life, or, or whatever, whatever that ends up being. It, it, the funny part is it's not a model, so it's whatever God's wanting to see done at that moment. And we'll stay till 2 o'clock. And we'll stay, you know what, I tell you what, this, uh, this one time, we, we stayed until like 1, we stayed to 1 like every, every Friday, so... Uh, which is awesome because we're afterwards we're just we're just talking and building relationship. Yeah. You guys are welcome to stay for two, but I'm going to get it. Yeah, you're the one who did it. You talked as well as he does. I tell I tell you what, uh, there was this uh, the, there was this girl that came. Uh, I know her, and uh, she ended up staying until five in the morning, talking to talking to the husband and wife of the house. You know. That's another thing. What I really, really see from, uh, and I, I'm not like trying to push you guys into this. I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, stoke a fire in it. That, you know, what I really love about home fellowship and what I do on Friday nights is that we're going to a home. We're going to a, fa- we're going to a place where a family works and exists and, and is, is uh, growing and uh you know, has the abundance of blessing, yeah. It's real. It's real. real. Well, it's kind of like this. If I come from a broken home, uh, I mean, I can come in here, 
But it's not like I can, I mean, I see your family, I see your family, uh, I, I see my <laughs> well, I'm from a broken home right now, <laughs> okay? I, I'm, I'm, put, I'm putting myself in that place. Uh, you know, I, I see all you guys' family, but see, whenever I'm going into a home that has a functioning family, I'm like, because, you know, I have, a, I have a broken heart against family. I'm like, no, I, I can't trust the father, he left me. I can't trust the mother. She, she left us for another guy and, and just abandoned me. You go into a home, it, it's kind of like this. We follow an image. Christ, Christ is an image we follow. And we follow whatever image we're following. If it's drugs and, and, uh, and, and drinking and uh, to drunkenness and, and all this, then we're going to follow that and we're going to be that. Whatever image we follow is what we're going to be. That's why God said, I got to be the first. I got, I got, I, I am your God, no, no other idol, no, no other thing can be higher than me. So whenever we come there, it's like this. They have a functioning marriage. What if my, like I said, I'm, I'm from a broken home. My, my parents' marriage didn't work. So my instant uh, heart about that is that marriage can't work. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's the image of my home, that marriage can't work. And that since marriage can't work, family can't work. But I come into that, into that atmosphere, and it's just like, wow. I mean, I, I've been here for how many hours? Seven to one, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm seeing, I'm seeing a marriage, and they're not fighting. They're not, they're not feuding with each other. They're not angry with each other right now. And uh, they, they genuinely love each other, and you can see it in, in their body language. You can see it. Uh, even with their children, even with their children, you go into, if I'm from a broken home, going into a home, and it doesn't have to be a home fellowship like something organized, but if you're inviting me into your home and I'm from a broken home and I see your family working, it's just like, it puts a hope in me. Family can work. It works for them. It can work for me. My family came from a bad place. Things happened to us, but th that's not... That's not, uh, that's not the norm. That's, that's not, you know, across the board what happens. Family can work. Marriage can work. And there's examples. The, this couple, uh, I'm, I'm coming to their house. They're an example of a marriage that can work in the family. And, and it's also, uh, man, the, this home fellowship I'm going to, it, oh, it's like restoration because uh, the, the wife, her, her husband left her and cheated on her. And uh, so that was a biblical divorce. And then she married uh, this, uh, this guy named Colt, and he's a, he's a strong believer. And, uh, I mean, you look at them and you would say, man, they've been married forever. Uh, and they've only been married for a year. But, uh, but then you would look and say, you know what? Their children, her children, it, it's, it's, it's as if as... You know, it was his children. They're, they're, you know, we're sitting on couches and they're laying up against them with the covers and they're going to sleep. And it's just like, wow, family can work. Yeah. They're living it before the children. Yeah, and they're living it. Yeah, that's true too. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. have gone completely haywire, some, right. not all, yeah. but a lot of them just living together. He said, no, no, no. Mom and dad need to be able to talk to the children and let them know what is right. Yeah. It is okay to get married at a certain age. So he said, I encourage my children now, no, not to get married this minute, he said, but I'm encouraging them when the time comes that they get married and make their whole yeah. life. You know, oh man, it's kind of like this, and you know, this is pastor's heart too. Is the reason why we're even hitting on this is that we're we're rebuilding a foundation, a foundation that has been severely damaged, and and unlike you know, and 
maybe our, our foundation here is more damaged than other places, but all in all, the church at large in this country, the foundation is damaged. Even, even in the big churches, the ones that are successful, quote unquote, their, their foundation is still damaged. So, uh, you know, consider yourselves blessed that we're, we're bringing this and we're teaching it to you. Because uh, God wants to not only restore what you guys had before, but bless it and bring it into where it's supposed to be. And like I said before, the, uh, the oneness and spirit and the, uh, the like-mindedness and one mind and one accord, that comes through the, the, the teaching, uh, the direction, and uh, you know, the Lord edifying, edifying us too, even through prophets, uh, and, and to bring us into that maturity. Uh, but all of, all of that is to say that, you know, uh, I mean, they sold their profit, property and is in possession, possession, shared their money with those who are in need. They worship, they worship together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and ger generosity, all while praising God and enjoying their goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Uh, you know, it's like this. I mean, they were meeting every day. They, not, not only at the temple. They were meeting, they were fellowshipping after. You know, they were, they, they were going to the temple probably in the morning to pray. And then they were going, because that's what they did. It was a lifestyle. It was a li it, yeah, it was a lifestyle. And it was a desire. It didn't become a religion that it was a model. It was just like, man, I need to go. I need to, and that's where it says don't forsake the fellowship, you know, the assembling of yourselves, the fellowship, is that that's where you're edified. And, and that should be a desire. If it's not, then you can show up here and get nothing out of what I'm saying. You can get zilch out of what I'm saying right now. If there isn't a desire for fellowship, then when we come in here, it, it'll just be another church. It'll just be another church. Yes, endurance. But uh, we'll go to, four, to uh, wait, 4.32. And I'm almost done. <laughs> yeah. We receive strength. Yeah. From one another when we come together. Yeah. Yeah. And because you're not getting out of mm. Now, I have a friend, bless her heart, she has been ill, and so she gets the gospel off the TV. I mm. tell her, don't come into condemnation because of that. But just know that she is able to, yes, go to the house of the Lord, to receive that fellowship with one another, mm -hmm. and, be, and be drawn strength from one another. Because you might be down, and you hear somebody with a testimony. Well, the word says this, that a man, uh, uh, it's not good for a man to be alone. And it wasn't just talking about <laughs> needing a wife. <laughs> and, th and this just all comes back to, you know, how we are a family and how how it is important that not that we just understand that, but that it becomes a revelation uh, of what we're doing. Because, you know, my generation, it's broken. It's got broken. I mean, there's a 40% fatherless rate. I don't know if you guys know this. 40% fatherless. That means the father's not in the home. 40%. It is expected to double in, in my generation's offspring. Double. 80%. 80, nationwide, 80%. Now, that's a big number, but that's how we've become, you know. And, uh, you know, we get to marriage, 27% of my generation marries, and in five years, 50% of them divorce. Well, it's even more than that, because they're getting into wrong marriages. 
You know, yeah, you know, you might feel this lovey-dovey feel, but that doesn't mean it's God. <laughs> you know, God has someone set out for you. And, I mean, I, I've had lovey-dovey feelings for girls, you know, and I almost got married to one, but that doesn't, that doesn't justify anything. Thank God God frustrated her <laughs> to break it up or else uh, I'd be, huh? I'd be, no, I'd be getting divorced right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she, she she now openly speaks against what I what I what I'm teaching. So uh, obviously, it wasn't <laughs> meant to be at all. And uh, the Lord, I mean, yeah, she had green eyes. She was a blonde. Anyway, but the the point is, is that uh, you know. Uh, there's a real issue, and uh, if the church is just reflecting the issue outside the doors, then we're no good, no better than they are. Uh, it's, man, it reminds me of the, what Jesus said, uh, uh, you've made God's house a den, of, a den of thieves. So, wait, wait, wait a second. So, the, God's house was just like the world. So Jesus came in there with a cat of nine tails, <laughs> tipped over tables, <laughs> smacked people. <laughs> I don't know if he whipped any, but <laughs> he, he might have actually been justified if he did that. I mean, he, he is coming to judge us, but uh, it was in the wrong timing, though. But, uh, but he came in there and cleaned it out. You know what I noticed about that? Didn't the kings of Israel do the same thing? They came in there, they started, they first off started righteous and they, they, they cleansed the idols out of the temple. And that's what one of the first acts Jesus did was cleanse the idols out of the temple. That was the mammon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's, but, okay, so we're going to get into the, this is my last scripture reference here, so Acts 4, 32 through uh, 37, all believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles didn't tell them that. Yeah, it's the love of God too, yeah. The apostles didn't say, oh, you know, everything you have is not yours, so you need to give it. You need to give it to me, you need to give it to my church, my ministry, my outreach program, my building, plan, my building fund, yeah. It's not your money, give it to me, I'm going to build onto this church. <laughs> it, it, the apostles didn't say that. Yeah, so God told me to tell you, your money is not yours, you need to give it to me. No, no, they didn't say that. That, okay, you got, oh my gosh, you're talking about when the Spirit came and the Spirit was falling on them, right? And I mean, the believers were responding to what the apostles were teaching them and saying, man, we need to fellowship. Man, we need to, the stuff we have, it's not even mine. So why am I trying to store it up and keep it for myself? Man, I need to give it in advance the kingdom. I mean, you're... Okay, we'll get into that. I think, I think we will. Yeah, yeah, we will. But, you know, they're selling their lands and to, to help other churches throughout the, the region. Well, to them, the world. <laughs> they, thought it, they thought it was, uh, they thought it was uh, the world. A little that they knew, but... But they were given to other churches, helping them advance the kingdom of God in, in, in their cities and uh, their regions. And you what? They were given to other saints. I mean, uh, man, I know a pastor in northern Texas. He used to pastor a 12,000 member church. 12,000. And, uh, you know, he'd teach tithe and he'd teach seed giving and, 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 and this. And you know, we need to build onto the church, we need to do this, and you need, 
your money's not yours, it's mine, <laughs> kind of thing. And, and now, uh, God got a hold of him, and now he doesn't even have a church anymore. He does home fellowships strictly. Strictly. Home fellowships. And uh, he was telling me uh, that last year, $30,000 uh, was, not, was not paid necessarily to build, it, well, it wasn't paid to build onto a church or uh, for any other reason, it was to pay for electric bills. It was paid for mortgage payments on people's, uh, for people who were in need, e even in the body. We've, we've come out and, you know, now it's like, if, if you're a believer, then no, no, we're not helping you. There's, there's people out there that need help. It's just like, well, okay, then obviously we're not a family because <laughs> you're going to let me starve to, to reach other people? No, this is messed up. We need to bring it back. So $30,000 in, in northern Texas, uh, what, maybe four home churches? I don't know. But anyway, we're to go to electric bills of, of believers uh, who, who just couldn't afford it and uh, mortgage payments, people that were about to go into foreclosure, uh, food to help believers stay alive, you know. And, and, and uh, $30,000, I mean, I don't know the biggest church around here, but do you think... You know, they've been, they gave 30000 to help their own members with their own issues. No way. No, no, no. They don't, they don't have that kind of money. <laughs> they're, they're bringing it in. <laughs> they're bringing it in. They, well. I believe the Lord wants us to help the members if we see yeah. a need in our body to help them. But he also wants us to give to the missions. Give, give to missions, exactly. Yeah. I didn't ask him about that part. I didn't. I didn't ask him if they gave to missions or anything. But he he said clearly that thirty thousand dollars went to all these needs, and, and whatnot. Uh, but I mean, and that was. I mean, I don't. I don't even think he had to preach on that either. It's just like that was just the abundance of their heart. They're just like, our, our believers starving. I mean. Hello, he needs food money, you know, he needs grocery money. That's not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's not something you have to pray about. That's not, if you need a leading of the Spirit, no. It, it says to help the oppressed. It says to help the poor. You know, uh, I don't know if uh, I'll be able to, hopefully in the future I'll be able to teach you more, uh, but God wants us to be people of justice. Men and women of justice. The ones who bring God's justice on... I'm not talking judgment. I'm talking justice. Uh, where, you know, there's people hungry. Okay, well, obviously, we need to feed them. And we need to be the ones to do it. Not, not, not pray and ask that God send somebody else to do my job. You know? But actually do it ourselves. The hungry, well, the hungry need food. So... I mean, if anything, faith. Go in faith and, you know, say, what the, the Word says, if, if you give to the poor, you're lending to God. Uh, I think God's going to give you a good return. I'm just guessing, yeah. Now, I know there are, there are maybe negative things people could say about Larry Rice. I don't have any negative to say. But he started what he's doing now in the front room of his home. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, part part of my heart with home fellowships and whatnot, God gave me this. You know, we hear the verse, uh, a house of prayer, you know, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Uh, it, it's God really put this in my heart for let like for Lebanon. Uh, imagine that if geez, if just one out of three homes was a place of refuge for the hurting and the abandoned. Uh and I mean, even a place of fellowship, yeah, you know, invite other believers. And it's not like it has to be 10 people, you know, just invite, like, I'll invite Russell, <laughs> you know, come over to my house and we'll fellowship. Uh, I mean, man, just two days ago, I fellowshiped with a guy over the phone for three hours. I haven't even met the guy, but uh, my spiritual father, uh, he's a spiritual son of his. Anyway, but, you know, uh, but a place of refuge for the hurting. Yeah. Mm -hmm.